I want to share with you a personal story that changed my life. Well, that story goes back to the time sustainability concept was being carved many, many years ago. And、uh, this is something that's very much in our minds today, so it's kind of actual. So I was very close to nature all my life. Since I was two years old, my grandfather and his、um, friend, this was a, an indigenous Brazilian guy, would take me to nature. And they taught me everything I know and love about nature. But during a period of my life later on, I spent almost over a decade、uh, away from nature because I became an Olympic athlete and、uh, worked, you know, playing for my country, and I also studied medicine. And that combination took me away from nature for a long time. Well, that drove me completely crazy, and I decided to create a strategy to go back to nature so my coach wouldn't kill me. And that strategy was to go on expedition.、Uh, so I led and, and I designed and led several expeditions all my life, some 25, to the farthest corners of the world,、uh, the, wild, the wildest places. I climbed Aconcagua, for example, the highest mountain out of the Himalayas,、um, southern Argentina and、uh, southern Andes, Argentina and Chile,、uh, twice. Once, I took, over, took up there a very big、uh, TV crew. The second time I soloed, I did it alone. I, I walked the glaciers of, Panta, of、uh, Patagonia, went to Pantanal,、uh, Central Africa, I crossed the Sahara east west, and the times you could do that because I could drive then. Today, if you fly over it, you may be shot down. So it's ch- times had changed. And、uh, climbed Kilimanjaro and many different things. Have I been, you name it, I've been there. Um, by being there, I was exposed to problems of nature that I had no clue existed, really didn't. And I started to, that bothered me very much, so I started to research and realize a lot of people already knew about this, but I didn't. So there's already environmental movements going on. This is about mid 80s. And、uh, so、um, I decided to. Understand what was going on. So I reached out to people that I felt w a s much smarter than I am. Well, they still are. And, but those people were basic businessmen. They were not、uh, environmentalists. I didn't have environmentalist friends at the time. So mostly businessmen, one big scientist, and I started to talk about it. And we concluded at the end that most, a big part of the reason where the environment, for the environmental degradation was money. Was making a buck. Let's elaborate on that. You get, let's separate two very, very、uh, extreme groups very big industry and the poorest of the poor. Big industry, they make money by producing things and selling things, and they raise a lot of, they make a lot of money, they pay dividends to their shareholders. That's how it works. In doing so, They use some technologies that are not really the best, or they weren't perfect at the time, and it generated environmental consequences that probably they, didn't even, they weren't even aware about,、uh, or, uh, the, of those consequences at the time. In the other side of the spectrum, you have the, little, the poor of the poor, the little families. Let's picture one family in the middle of Amazonia living out of directly natural resources. They have to chop one hectare per year of that forest, otherwise, they die. So, simple enough, they have to do it. So, basically, both of them are about making money and they're generating a negative impact to nature. So, with that conclusion,、um, I got back those, those people that I mentioned a little while ago, those smart guys, and、uh, we created an institution, Pro Natura. As a form of contribution, it was our contribution to try to address the problem. And Pro Natura was born in 1985 as,、uh, in Brazil as、uh, an environmental、um, sustainable development、um, div- agency, media agency. And it had, we, we, came, we came up with a 50 year plan, 5 0, not common at the time, not my idea either. Some of the smart, one of the smart guys, and that was very helpful, one of the best things we've ever done. 
And we then went on, and what Pernatura did, its focus, was to build sustainable economic anchors in impoverished regions with sensitive populations that needed a different economic model to have a dignified quality of life without de destroying nature. That was, the, that was the purpose. So we started doing it, developed the methodology, we implemented it in some 60, over 60 countries, and 30 years went on of the 50-year plan, and we then decided to scale it up. That was part of the plan, the next 20 years was scaling it up, but so we then partnered with the best institution we found for that. This was the International Finance Corporation. That is the private investment arm of the World Bank. The, the best and the biggest financial institution specialized in development. They had 60 years of experience, twice as what we have, that we had at the time. So this was about 2015. And together we created something we call today the shared value platform. The shared value platform is an operational and financial structure that deploys sustainable, climate-friendly, inclusive economies in those impoverished regions, farthest corners of the world, but with a specific characteristic. Those regions must be on the area of influence of very, very large investments. Oil, mining, road, rail, hydro, so forth. Why is that? Why do we choose to do that in, this, in these areas of influence? It's because those industries, the purpose of the shared value platform is to create real scale economic models of sustainable economic living. So those areas of around those big industries, big investments, mega investments, multi-billion dollar, they are, those industries are capital intensive, they are not labor intensive, they, are, they don't employ much, and the little bit they employ is very high quality and skilled people that you don't find in that region. However, they do create an illusion and an impression of wealth. Billions of dollars coming to my region, I'm going to get rich, or I'm gonna, at least I'm going to get a job. I'm going to make a buck. And it never happens. And once that doesn't happen, it generates frustration. Frustration leads to social unrest. Social unrest leads to social degradation, violence, and leads to the mess we have today. The difference between regions that those investments happen and regions that don't is that when they happen, they accelerate the process and the region gets destroyed much faster. Well, the platform has a methodology that reverts that process and creates a much faster example of positive impact. The platform uses the, the financial muscle that goes into a region with, with such investments and turn them into a sustainable economy for those regions, reducing everybody's risk, the business, the government, the communities, in nature. I'll tell you how that works. It works in two phases. Phase one is we um, go into a region, map stakeholders, engage them. First exercise we do is choose the value chains that are appropriate for them, with them. They need to own this. So let's imagine we come up with between four and eight value chains of an economy that could be linked somehow to the investment, but ideally not. Ideally, they would become independent someday. So once you have, let's say, six business plans, uh, you have an investable pipeline. With the investable pipeline, you can know exactly how much money you need to bring those businesses to fruition. Those are all social businesses, okay? But they need to grow at scale to become an economic anchor. So once you have that picture of how much money you're going to need along, how long, you know, through a period of time, usually 15, 10 to 15 years, more to 15 than to 10, to build them properly, you then raise the money, and the money has a special characteristics in this case. It's something called a blended finance facility. A blended finance works like this. About 20% of the amount of money raised are necessary for the business, building the business plans, 
investing on them, is non-profit impact, philanthropic capital. And the 80% is for-profit uh, for impact capital. The 20% of this invest in de-risking that portfolio of investments so that the for-profit money has uh, the appetite to invest. Otherwise, it would not show up. Private sector investors, they have to measure risk and return, and if the risk is too high, they just don't invest. So the money would not be available to those businesses. By de-risking them, they invest. So let's, let me give an example of that. Let's imagine we're going to do over the middle of Amazonia, in an area we have a big hydro dam, and um, you then have 30,000 fishermen, the subsistence fishermen, that went out of fish, because it's no longer a river, it's a lake now. So they want to continue to do fish, so they have to become fish farmers. In order for them to become fish farmers, you need to teach them a lot of technology, because it's a big jump from one to the other. So you use that impact capital for non-profit impact philanthropic capital to train them. Once you train them, the for-profit capital is going to look, okay, I have this business to invest, I have this skilled labor right here, so I'm, I'm safe to invest. So they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't. So this is an example of the blended finance, how it works. So once this is the, the phase one, and what I just gave you is an example of a pilot. We always do, within phase one, one pilot of one of the business chains. So we can show to the communities what we're talking about, what they should look for, forward to, and to investors, a proof of concept of that investment. So that's all fine. So once this is all designed, <clears throat> we go to the market, raise the money, make the investments, and then this phase two is making the investments over 15 years. Now, the level of complexity that we're talking about here, at the scale we're talking about, millions of people involved, billion-dollar investments in social businesses, this has never done before, has never been done. So we need, the only way to do it is two partnerships. You need all sectors of society, government, private sector, academia, NGOs, everybody needs to be part of this process. So the first step we did in order to gather all those people is the International Finance Corporation partnered with Fundação Getúlio Vargas, which is a very big think tank in Brazil, very prestigious, one of the five biggest in the world. They gathered 200 of those different institutions from all walks of life for two and a half years, working very hard in six different thematic groups, and they came up with a set of guidelines that would make in large investments in the Amazonia ecosystem sustainable and generating a positive impact. What should happen for that to be positive impact, not negative impact? So, with the guidelines scheduled, structured, where there's 200 institutions in the world, we matched with the methodology of the shared value platform, and it was a perfect match. So we decided to implement it. We decided for four countries implemented first. Peru, Brazil, Mozambique, and Nepal. I won't go into details why each one, but believe me, there is a, these were chosen, each one for a reason. Once we decided to implement it, we brought in, we had Pronatura and International Finance Corporation, so we invited two other partners, the Water Resources Group, which is a structure that came out of the World Economic Forum, and it's formed by the World Bank, leading it, and Harvard University. So, very good pedigree. And another group was Madeira Group. The Madeira Group is a private independent group that measures the sustainability results of private sector investments. It's a very specific niche, and you need this independently done, as Madeira does, for attracting the impact capital that wants the impact, apart from their profits as well. So we started the implementation of that, and in the end of the day, the platform really doesn't want to save the world. We're not arrogant enough, a little bit, but not enough, to say we're going to save the world. What we want to do with the platform is to create real-scale 
models that can be then replicated and, and um, you know, dissipated around the world for everywhere. Nothing succeeds more than success. So, a very smart guy told me that too. That, so, you having good examples, it's going to be replicated, and, and there we go. So, uh, one last piece of message that we really believe in is that private sector has a very important role to play here. It has the cash, it has the technological resources. Arguably, those were used to create the problem, but in some, in some instances, but they are the ones that need to be leading this process to create the solution at the scale we need. And one last element, if you want to pinpoint one success factor for this alone, is partnerships. No one does, does this alone. So with new communications and all that, we really need everybody to come together and to do this together. So this is a very good example of a solution through partnerships. And that's what I had to tell you today. Thank you.